Over the years, I have grown more attracted to saying something I couldn't say when I was a little bit younger. For about 40 years of my life, look, I could never admit that I don't know things. And now I'm entering old age, it's such a pleasure to answer to students when they ask the most complicated, vital, or abstruse questions, I don't know. And then I say, go and find out. Or, let's find out. Let's do it in the space of the classroom. Okay, let me try this here. Oh, this is not going to work, is it? Can I go out? Oh, we'll do it here. There we go. Now, here's some questions for you, because we're all experts. We train translators, and we all know about technologies, don't we? I'm 62. I love technology. It's not true. All guys, all guys can use technology. Is it more efficient to post edit neural machine translation? I have to update this slide, obviously, than translating from scratch. If you go through online machine translation, I do, and you post edit, you fix it up. Is that more efficient than translating from scratch? Who says yes? Who says no? Who doesn't know? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> we. Me. When we deal with technologies, and I agree 100% with the previous speaker, we have to work with the technologies, but they are so diverse and they are changing so fast that no professor can assume that they've got all the answers. And the answer we gave six months ago is not the answer we give today. We have to say, I don't know. Let's find out. Another one. Ah. Is it working with machine translation? Is it more efficient to pre-edit the text? That is, write it in very clear, simple language, and then feed it through the machine translation, or post-edit? Who says it's more efficient to pre-edit? Who says it's more efficient to post-edit? Who says it depends? Who has no idea? Right, we don't know. Okay. Yeah, uh, clients send you a translation memory to use in your project, if you are translators these days. Should you use it as it comes, even if it has errors in it, or should you correct it? Who says we should use it as they send it? Who says we should correct it? Who has no idea? Or who knows that it depends on the client and the nature of the error? When you're translating, we have to teach process translation processes as much as correct equivalence on the level of the text. I do a lot of process work in class. Should a translator translate fast and then revise for a long time, or translate slowly and revise for a short time? Who likes to go fast and then revise a lot? Who likes to go slowly and then revise a little? It's a different mindset. Huh? <laughs> Uh, actually, what we find, uh, we, we do this in class, we find we use a model of four different translator styles, but I try to show that there is no correct way of distributing effort. It's a personality-based thing, uh, as Professor Bastard agrees. Okay. Should you revise a translation with or without looking at the source text? Uh -huh. Who knows? Hmm. I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, should you translate into L2? Well, in China, that's a no-brainer. There's not enough English speakers, L1 English speakers, so you guys have to go into L2 English. But in many other cultures, it's a real question and open to debate. Um, if you go 30% faster than your normal translation pace, will you lose quality? Who says, yes, of course you will? Who knows that you won't? My two students then know that you won't because we do this in class every year. <laughs> I prove to them they can go 30% faster and get just about the same quality. Um, are translators able to negotiate with the text using clients? I, I just put this here because I'm questioning in most, much of this uh, a pamphlet in every sense of the word put out by uh, Chris Durbin, it's called Translation, Getting It Right, 
and it's to educate clients, but thereby translators, about how the market works and how you should operate as a professional. And Chris, who's, who's a very good professional and has a very successful business in Paris, uh, thinks she knows the answer to all these things. She assumes also that the translator can negotiate directly with the client. Often these days, you can't because of agencies. She is sure that she knows the answer to these things. I am happy to admit I don't know. And I wonder how it is that she is so sure of herself. Now, if we've got many questions like that, how can we teach? How can we teach our students when the very nature of our knowledge is unstable and changing? Largely because of technology, or not only technology, I think it has to do with the nature of language as well. You will say, ah, we can call on translation research. Very well. For many of my questions, it concerns the cognitive processes of the way translators translate. And so I can look at some process research, cognitive research. It exists. But in all that research, there's only about 400 subjects being studied in very, very isolated languages at very, very specific levels. Now, I know that there are exactly 333,000 professional translators and interpreters in the world. Give or take 100,000. It's a rough ballpark figure. But how can 400 represent 333,000? Not at all. I mean, just, just on the basic sampling of this, you have to suspect that the, the research that we have got published is more on the level of examples of what can happen rather than what will happen or what tends to happen. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about using research in the classroom and I do bring research into the classroom but always with many, many grains of salt. That is, with uh, an encouragement of doubt. Also, it's a very, very important thing, a lot of the research is on professionals. What, who are, how do professionals work? How do professionals compare with novices? Which is a key research question for us. Because if you define how novices work and how professionals work and you map the difference, that's what we should be teaching. That's one way of getting some content. Okay? Uh, but in many, many, many of our classes, we cannot be sure that we are training people who are going to be translation professionals. Uh, the classes I've been teaching, uh, certainly in Spain for many, many years, uh, regularly about a third would spend any serious amount of time as translators or interpreters. But most meander through professions these days. Um, and I suspect that probably happens in China, given the huge numbers of students in MTA programs. How can you proceed? How can you teach when our knowledge is unstable? You can be an expert and assume you're an expert. And that happens. I taught for many years in Monterey, in the United States, where you have leading professionals, especially conference interpreters, who come in and they teach in a master apprentice type relationship. And it's true, the students fill in and observe how the master does the performance as necessary. Uh, that, uh, that is good in some particular circumstances with some very special uh, trainers. Okay? I'm not much of a master, as you might expect. I'm more interested in a process of discovery which might be problem-based learning, but I hesitate to subscribe to the whole football team. I use simple empiricism as a method. I'm going to give you examples of the method, okay? I'll go very quickly. First, what I do with my courses, I ask students to give me three things they would like to know about translation or interpreting. Three things I'd like to discover. And each year is different. This is just a, a mapping of some of the answers I got for a couple of years there. And you'll just see that um, I was teaching in Vienna and in Monterey, that the Vienna and Monterey questions are really quite different. If just look for technology, for example. Okay, the, the American students really want to know about technology. The Austrian students, well, not so much. Okay. 
and in some places it's different between BA and MA level. That's just to give you an idea of how different each group is. And I must admit, I, I buck all the rules about syllabus design and getting the syllabus approved before the course. I go through all the hoops that I have to go through, but they ask the students what they want, and I change it. I don't tell anybody. And nobody complains. Okay. Uh, you can play with this five-year plan mentality that comes through competence design. Uh, you can try to address the questions that are most important for the people in front of you. That's what student-based learning means for me. It runs head-on to this idea of the fully planned curriculum going down to detailed syllabi for each particular class. You've got to be able to adapt. Okay, so I use basic empiricism. I said, I don't know. Then we find out, what could it be? We get some kind of hypothesis. What could it be? Ah, perhaps pre-editing is more efficient than post-editing, for example. Okay, then we find out. And then we get the results. That is, each student gets the results that pertain to their own personality, disposition, and interests. Okay? And uh, at the end of that, we can change the hypothesis and you can be, start the whole thing over again. If you have enough classes, usually you don't. I'm going to give you some examples now. That's all I'm going to do. So you can stop me, because I've got lots of examples. And, and you just stop me, and that's, that's all you get, right? Okay. So, I'm testing the effects of post-editing. What do I do? This is the instructions that my students get. The problem, if you want problem-based learning, is very clear. Is it better to post-edit or translate from scratch? It's a market-based problem because we've got these tools on the market and time is money, so efficiency is, is, is key to it. And I do a really lousy experiment. I just divide the class in half. Here's the same text. You guys post edit, you guys translate from scratch, see how long it takes you, get time, then you revise each other, and we get a very rough estimate of quality. And we can see what happens. Okay. Do we know what's going to happen? Do you know? Not really, unless you look at the next slide. Okay, uh, we just get the time. And we find that on average, without machine translation, is slightly faster. Whoops, sorry. Well, time, all groups. Mm -hmm. No, yes, with machine translation is a little bit faster. But on average, not by much. And it's not significant. But what have I shown the students just in the, doing this exercise? Hey, it's worthwhile looking at it because you're not going to lose anything. You may not gain a great deal, and it's true, you don't really gain a great deal in time, generally, some people do, but you're not going to lose anything. So let's look at this thing called technology, let's look at post-editing and see how we can get better at it, since this is usually the first time they do it, and it's not a bad result for the first time that they're into it. Uh, you'll see, by the way, that I have multilingual classrooms, <coughs> so I have to find ways of teaching a multilingual group. That's not the case in your country, so I won't insist on that. Uh, here's a, a, a principle that I use in class. Really, this is philosophy. It's not problem-based, but it's real philosophy. And it comes from uh, a French scholar, Arnaud Leigh, who worked on the philosophy of dialogue. And his idea was that there are basically two ways to translate a text. You process the words as objects, front of you, or you personify the words and you construct a person behind them, and you enter into a dialogue with a human being who is certainly imaginary and based on words, but uh, humanized, and that the translation will thereby be more sensitive to the concerns of that person, rather than follow the dictates of the linguistic words on the page. So, uh, for Leg, and I teach this to all my students, when you get a text, don't ask, what does this mean? This object, this thing on the page, what does this mean? Try to ask, what do you mean? You, the person behind this text who has produced it. And I really believe in this. The trouble is, when we get down and do 
actual research on personification, and I've got a doctoral student working on this now, it's really quite rare, which is a pity. And you find things that are upsetting or might make you think about it. Here, for example, this is Amy Winehouse, you might recognize her. Uh, this is uh, eye tracking of a person who is sight translating the text. It's an interview with her, and it's being sight translated. Okay, eye tracking, lots of complex things, we know that. <coughs> That's a woman sight translating. That's, no, sorry. That's a man. <laughs> That's a woman. <laughs> What's the difference? Who personifies, the man or the woman? And then afterwards we do interviews and, and they talk about the translation process. And I try to see if they use a third person pronoun, it, or a second person, uh, you, or a she, to say that they were talking about the person. The woman personifies more than the man. Which is worrying. I start to get this hypothesis that women translate differently from men. I'm not too sure I want to go there. But the students seem interested. And if they're interested in experimenting and pursuing this, that's fine by me. I test the existence of norms. A lot of what we teach, if you teach descriptive translation studies at all, you might teach the idea of norms. And I want to know, do norms actually exist? How do they operate? So every year I use this silly little text for Dragon Naturally Speaking. I get them to translate it. Whoops. Going backwards at 40. And there's lots of interesting things in the text, but I'm not going to go into that now. I just look at the brand name, which is repeated there. And I see who in the group kept it in English, who translated it into the other language, or translated it into the other script since we have Asian languages in that group, and who did it once and who did it twice. Okay, so I'm asking the question, if we don't know, what do you do with a foreign brand name? Do you translate it? Do you transcribe it? What do you do? Ah, do you leave space there? It's another question, but I'm not getting into that. Uh, this is just one year in the Monterey group. You can see I've got my, my various languages. And it's very clear that the French people all agreed. They all did the same thing. They kept it in English twice, which is very good for French people. A very homogeneous translation culture over there. I think there are only five students, so it's easy to agree when there are only five of you. Okay. Spanish almost, German a bit more descent. Over here, though, the poor Korean, Chinese, Japanese. Oh, dear me, nothing knows what to do. Lots and lots of different takes on this one. Why? Well, they have another script to deal with, so it, it complicates the matter. There is very little agreement here. Russian, you see, is sort of between Asia and Europe. They've got the script problem, but they generally agree with the, the European norm. It's just a, a silly example to show that there are different norms. There is no rule for all cultures. Different translation cultures have different norms for solving a fairly minor problem like this. But the same holds for the more complex uh, problems of translation that we're dealing with. I teach Skobos, uh, that is, I teach people that the important factor in a text, to translate a text, is the purpose it has to achieve in the target culture. I don't think I believe that very much, but I teach it because it's one of the ideas that's out there. The thing about Scopus is you can turn it into a problem. So Scopus suggests that, that if we have a text to translate and we give different instructions to the translators, they'll produce different texts. Okay? Now, now that's interesting because I don't know if that's true. And it's something we can do in class. And I do it every year. So half the class translate for purpose A, the other half for purpose B. Actually, I usually have four purposes, so I divide them up into groups. It depends how big the class is. And we see what happens. Okay? Now, the text, I get, what a lousy script this is. Actually. <laughs> anyway, um, I give them this text. And I don't know if that's going to head count, probably not. Yeah. And I'm only interested in this word eaten. Really? Somebody said you have to focus on one problem. It's very true. One problem per class because translation, as you know, 
you know, I, I could talk about all the translation problems there for probably a month. But here my class is on Skopos, and I picked Eton. Why? Because it's the object of a classic debate uh, between, I think, uh, uh, Hans Hoenig and, and Peter Newmark, one of the great classic debates of translation scholars, uh, where Hans Hoenig in Germany said we have to explain what Eton College is to our students, Eton School. Uh, Peter Newmark objected, he was a grand old English gentleman. What rubbish! Everybody knows what Eton is. You're insulting the reader. And uh, all right, I won't go into that debate too much. We can see what the students do. Okay? And here we go. I've got options. One, Eton, Eton twice. Two, Eton, and, and paraphrase. Uh, Eton school, giving a, a, a specific specification. Procedure school, Eton, a procedure school. Uh, like Eton. Okay, so we've got these different ones. I think one is missing. Somebody said Ivy League. They were very creative American translators who called it an Ivy League school, which is entirely wrong, by the way, because it's a secondary level and Ivy League a university level. Yeah, however, I gave them different instructions translate for a coffee, uh, a history book, a coffee table book with images, philosophy, or biography. And you can see that in some cases the, um, the instructions gave different results. Okay? That the history book people offered 40, 40, 40, and the coffee table book is the odd one out here. Uh, so the result is do different instructions lead to different translations? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. It depends on how radical the instructions are. Okay, so this is an easy exercise. Anybody can do it in class. Uh, I'm, I'm working on localization. I've got uh, a theory I want to get out there that uh, websites can be standardized through different cultures or they can be highly adapted and localized. Okay, so I'm talking about standardization or adaptation or localization. And I just give an exercise for students to do looking at websites in the same sector, it might be banks, for example, find one that's multinational and one that's local. And look to see how they are localized. Which ones are, which ones aren't. Okay? And you find the most incredible examples of translation, working alongside uh, visual adaptation, working alongside radical rewriting. And you find that translation is, is slotting into these texts, these web texts, alongside many other professions and many more interesting things, which might give people an idea. This is the USA Gov. Okay, very simple website. What do people care about if they go in English? Find a job. Travel, money, and credit. Okay? Put it into Spanish. And you've got immigration and getting citizenship. And you've got an Hispanic looking guy, the whole thing's changed, all right? It's really, really adapted according to the language about what, you know, that they know that person is in there. And it's not translation. The actual chunks of text are translated, but the way they are arranged and presented and the visuals that are with them are quite different. This is very good for getting across the idea of localization and how and why it should be done. And they're really cool, the Americans. Kids, go. Yeah, and it's one for kids. They're doing high school projects on the American government, and it's highly adapted to kids. And there the translations exist, but they are rewritten for a completely different register. OK, those are just some examples of the way the classroom can be a space of problem-based discovery. We can integrate technologies into it. We can address the questions that the students themselves have and you can have a whole lot of fun. I invite you to try it. Thank you very much.